Welcome, everybody. Uh, I think the first thing we're going to try and dig into really is um, Rewind's data recovery plan in general and some of the things that we looked at internally um, and the decision factors that went into why we, we decided to actually revamp our data recovery plan not too long ago. And I think like all actions, it tends to start with some evaluation of like impact to the business. Like for us, the biggest impact that we could make really is reducing risk. And it wasn't too long ago where we sat down and we took this like long, hard look at the risk profile of the business and we kind of realized that things had changed. You know, back in the day when we were a smaller company, we had uh, fewer customers and like in all honesty, like our risk tolerance was a lot higher. If things went wrong, the impact wasn't as big. Um, but that started to change as the business started to see more success. And it eventually got to this point where we started to, to realize like there would be a material impact to the company um, if we didn't make a more concerted effort to build a more resilient um, plan for data recovery. And if I'm being honest, like that was this aha moment for the company because we're like, oh, this matters. Like this is actually something that brings value to the company. And, you know, Dave, you probably can recall when I came to you and I said, like, you know, I think it's time to up our game here. Right. And when you reflect back, like talk to us about some of the aspects of, of that recovery capability that, that you looked at and you said, like, OK, these are areas we probably want to we want to focus in on because they're problem spots. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, um, we so like like a lot of you know companies out there, we're deployed in the public cloud, and there's definitely an, in our case it's AWS, and there's definitely a perception that oh well you know the cloud takes care of it, like our own business of SaaS backups. Oh, the SaaS provider takes care of it, and that's that's not true. They provide you baseline tools to help with you know things like recovery and reliability, but you know it's a shared responsibility model, so it's your responsibility. And you know when I went and looked at things, I when James came to me and said, hey, hey let's let's look at leveling up our disaster recovery uh, story here. Um, you know, I thought we had generally good uh, single availability zone resilience. So, you know, in, in Amazon terms, that's, you know, single data center. We didn't have a reliance on a, a single data center. We were deployed and we do deploy rewind across multiple geographic regions. Uh, for data residency regions. So I thought we had, you know, uh, limited exposure there, but we didn't have a documented plan. We'd never tested, you know, hey, if a single region goes away, can we fail over? We didn't have, you know, a good, a good list of, you know, hey, who could even say that we should invoke a disaster recovery plan because we didn't have a disaster recovery plan. Um, and, you know, just fundamentally, we can't be a backup vendor and not have, you know, a good DR plan for how do we, how do we disaster recovery our own data? So I think we had most of the pieces in place, but we, but we never documented them and we never tested it. And I think that is the 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 key level up thing is is you know coming up with a plan, documenting and testing it. Yeah, totally. And obviously the key piece is like once we start going down that rabbit hole, like we got to be thinking about like what are those core components of a recovery plan. So like when you started to actually like dig into the nuts and bolts. Where did you start? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, for me, I, I've done this before in, in a past life or something similar to this. And one of the first things to look at um, is uh, two, two terms called RPO and RTO. And James, you can now ask me, hey, Dave, what is RPO and RTO? Well, James, um, okay. RPO and RTO. Um, <laughs> uh, so RPO is recovery point objective. So this is, this is, how much data can you afford to lose essentially so if you're if you're let's say your disaster recovery strategy is restoring from a backup and your backup runs every day at midnight and you have a disaster at 11:59 that means you're losing the previous day's data essentially you're essentially saying we can afford to lose one day's worth of data so that's generally your recovery point objective is what point can you recover to and then the RTO or recovery time objective is how long would it actually take me to recover if i lost you know, an entire database, how long would it take me to bring up another database? An hour, a minute, a week? Um, and I think one of the first places to start, and I remember talking to you, James, about this was, okay, give me, give us some guidance here. What do you think our, you know, RPOs and RTOs should be? And from there, very quickly, you, you, you learn that there isn't just one RPO and RTO, because 
you have to actually classify the data that you're actually interested in in restoring it should a disaster occur. Most companies, most organizations have many different types of data, and some of them will have different levels of criticality depending on what they are. So, for example, um, if you have a database with all your customers and all their login information and all that stuff, you really don't want to lose any of that. You know, um, a high volume SaaS company that is having multiple signups per minute, you don't want to lose any of that. So maybe that has a, you know, a very high, a very low RPO. We cannot afford to lose more than a minute's worth of data. But maybe there are some other systems that process batch data where say this only runs once a day, maybe an RPO of a day is, is good enough. Um, so I think I think understanding the RPO and RTO, translating that into classify your data, and by association the services that process that data for you know what RPO and RTO do you need for those stakeholders? That's that's job one, starting point number one. Second point I looked at is who are the stakeholders of this? So who who needs to be involved in this? If we come up with a disaster recovery plan, who needs to approve this? Who can invoke the disaster recovery plan? Who needs to be involved if there was a disaster? Um, this was an area that I, I was personally weak in, and I learned a lot along this way, uh, thanks to some help from somebody on our team with a strategy that we'll talk about in a while. But I, I think I was very good on the technical side, and I was less uh, strong on the, on the you know, I'll call the procedural side or the operational side. But you do need to think about, you know, for example, if I have a disaster and it involves data, do, do I need to involve a privacy officer if I'm restoring to a different uh, geographic location? Does our customer success uh, team or customer support team need to notify customers? Come up with a list of all the stakeholders who are gonna be involved in it. You'll see by the way I'm talking here as well, is even though I consider myself a, a, still a fairly technical resource, Everything we've talked about so far is non-technical. Um, the next area I looked at was, um, you know, is, is compliance or data residency a factor? So I mentioned that Rewind, uh, we, we deploy services in multiple geographic locations for data residency reason, data residency being people in Europe want their data process in Europe. So if, if, if a, a system fails and it's in Europe, where are you going to restore that to? probably can't be a US location. So is there another geographic location available that you could actually use as a, as a disaster recovery region? So I kind of lump that into, you know, is compliance or data residency a factor? Um, and then the last thing is, you know, or the last two things is what, what kind of DR protection do you need? So back on the classification uh, uh, of data, that we talked about earlier on, you can have different levels of RPO and RTO, and that will lead you down different technical paths. So we actually have a blog post that covers this in quite a bit of detail on our Rewind website, but there are a bunch of different DR models you can use. So you could have, hey, our DR mode is, we're just gonna you know, we'll take a nightly backup and we're gonna restore it. And that is our, our DR plan if this service fails. Or you could have a warm standby. We're gonna run everything that we run in our main a production environment in another region and you know to switch over is literally just a flick of a switch and everything's running um, you could even have a true active active system we have a main system we have a backup system but they're both processing data and at any time one of them could fail and we would just automatically switch over to the other one all of those have different cost profiles uh, and they will depend on you know what rpo rto do you need for the data so considering what type of dr failover do you want um, the last, the last two things kind of go together, which is invest in a solid technical runbook. So as I said, I, I still consider myself a bit of a techie. And by solid technical runbook, what I mean is list every single command that you would run um, should you need to fail over a service. It may be just one command. Maybe you've automated everything so that it's just we press this big green button and magic happens and we fail over. Or maybe there's a series of commands. And there is definitely a tendency to, to miss out command. Oh, well, everybody knows we just, you know, we, we insert widget A into slot B. Be explicit. If this happens at two in the morning, the last thing you want to be doing is think, why is this command not working? It worked yesterday. Or the person writing the plan is not always the person executing the plan. So, you know, don't underinvest in a solid runbook. And the last thing which goes together with this is, and I've written this in bold in some notes here, is test the process. A DR plan that has never been tested is not a DR plan. Um, and we'll talk probably later on about, you know, uh, ways to test this. But I can't emphasize enough that you have to test the both the technical side of the plan and the process and people side of the plan.
that was it. That's yeah. that's my kind of top ten list really of things to consider. Those are big. A lot of stuff there. I kind of chuckled because I remember. I, I'm sure I came to you at some point with like unrealistic um, RPOs and RTOs. And it's a challenge, right? Because when you're talking to somebody like me who says, like, we absolutely can never be down and we always have to be highly available, there is certain, like, realities, if you will, that the business sort of needs to live by. And I think I think one of the key points you made there is in that classification, like, really understanding what is truly important um, and making sure that you you are very honest with, you, with yourself um, on that. So, yeah, really good stuff there. As, as we thought about building that plan, you know, we tried to make it a one person task. You know, the team wasn't that big when we sort of really started to take this seriously. Um, but you probably recall, like, you know, it took a lot more people and you sort of touched on that. So can you go into that a little bit more? Like who really needs to be involved in this? Yeah, so I, I'll work from the bottom up really. So on the bottom up, on the engineering side, we had a few people who were very, very familiar with the overall architecture of our system, all the services. We talked to you know even the developers, the people who, who wrote these services and talked about how data is accessed. That helped us then classify the criticality of data. So you need like, like one or two, in our case, a couple of core engineers, but that are relying on um, other people who know the, the real nuts and bolts of how the system works and how data is accessed. Um, we talked to you, James, um, obviously about, um, you know, hey, what do you want? What do you want this 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 thing to look like? And we had, as you said, some negotiation. Dave, I'd like this to be uh, real time within one minute. James, that's going to cost ten million dollars. Um, hello, are you still there? Hello. Um, so you know, everything's a negotiation, as as you said earlier on. Um, then we also we looped in actually our our security team. We're lucky enough here to have a, a we call it the trust team, but a security team. And we had somebody on there who was um, very familiar with our compliance side. So as a SOC2 compliant company, availability is part of that. And we had somebody who had a lot of experience in this. So we looped somebody in there who, and, and I think this was one of the key, key things we were lucky enough to have access to is somebody who has done this before at, at the whole you know, comprehensive level. I've done it at the technical level, but the people and processes side was a learning for me. And luckily we had somebody there who was who has done it before. And I think that is that is a key piece of advice I would give if you're just starting this today, is find somebody who's done it before. It can be internal, it can be through webinars like this, it can be through reading blog posts, it can be through talking to contacts who can introduce you to somebody. But but just being able to learn from somebody just you know vastly accelerates the process. Uh, the, the last piece I'll mention is just you know an operations team. So who's going to have to actually execute this DR plan? Um, is it the engineers who are coming up with the plan? Maybe, but maybe there's other people involved as well that are actually going to have to follow this list of directions. Involve those folks early on as well, so they're familiar with what you're doing. Yeah, I can't underscore that that point you made about like having somebody internal that that has done this before. Because like I remember you and I. We did a ton of, of work. We did all the things you 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 referenced, right? Like we we talked to people that were in the industry. Um, we read the blog posts. Um, we attended the webinars. Lots of really good content to be had there. But I think you agree. Like we, the biggest bang for our buck, the biggest value that we had, um, and the biggest asset in our pocket was that person who who had like been there, done that. That was big. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, at this point, um, so, you know, the business is recognized, we need to, we need to get better. Um, we've identified, uh, what we need to do. We know who's going to help us. Um, you, you made that comment about in bold capital letters, you know, testing the process. Let's talk about that. How do you test this thing? Yeah, this, this, this is a, this is a, I, I, just like you were saying about, you can't emphasize it enough. I can't emphasize this enough that you've got to test the process. And the, for me, again, there was a big learning here. So I, I'll talk about kind of stuff I'd done before. And again, this was mostly on the technical side is testing. It means going through the technical, the technical run book, make sure all the commands you've documented all the steps or the, or the processes on the technical level, restore this back up here, flick this switch, turn this knob, whatever, all that stuff, make sure that works. Now, I don't believe you actually have to do it in production. If you have a good staging environment, you can test it in a, in a staging environment, as long as staging mirrors production in terms of all the data, the systems, all that kind of stuff, that's probably good enough. If you can actually do live DR failovers in production, that, that's even better. 
Um, in a past life, I worked somewhere where we would monthly do a DR failover. We'd pick a service and we would actually fail it over to a to a an active active or active standby region. And then we'd say, yeah, this looks good. And then we'd fail it back. That's not always possible. It, it is possible, but it's not always possible. So either test it in the staging environment, test it in production. But the biggest learning for me here was this concept called tabletop testing. And I, I, re, I now realize this is fairly common, but I'd never been involved in it. And a tabletop test, I was skeptical of the value of it at first until I did it. And now I think it's absolutely critical. Everybody should do tabletop testing. And tabletop testing works like this. Somebody runs the tabletop test and they come up with a scenario. And one of the scenarios we ran through was, it's the day before Black Friday, and there's a fire in a particular data center where we run our services. What do you do? Um, it, actually, it was like Speed. That if anyone's ever seen the movie Speed, you know, hey, hot shot, you know, what do you do? You know, D Dennis Hopper famously said to Keanu Reeves, and it, it felt kind of like that. And of course, we jumped into well, we'd run this this list of technical commands and all these other bits and pieces, but. But that ended up actually being a small piece of the of the entire process. You know, there were questions that were asked that were, you know, what alerts do we have in place? How would we even know we need to invoke our DR procedure? Who has the authority to, to activate the DR procedure? Um, if the plan was activated, what rewind staff should be available? What if they aren't available? Um, who do you need to notify? What are the roles and responsibilities? A whole series of questions. And we've we've covered a lot of this in a, in a blog post on, on rewind.com, which I encourage people to read. But the tabletop test is get everybody who's a stakeholder together, which we've identified early, remember? Um, and run through the scenario, soup to nuts, from the technical side. You know, do you know where the run book is to actually run the commands? You know, here's the run book. Here's the people that need to be notified. Um, what happens do you have the contact when, information. <laughs> do you have the contact? Yeah. Have you got names, phone numbers, email addresses, you know, smoke signals, you know, flares, every, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, so we ran through this tabletop test and I, I, I think it was absolutely eye-opening for everybody on, on our team, which tends to be more technical focused as a, as a DevOps or CloudOps team, but super, super critical. And, you know, you've now got to run this regularly. So back to what I said earlier on, if you run this and then two years later, you, you've never touched this and you have a disaster, um, things aren't going to work. So you've got, you've got to build this into your, into your regular process. I don't think you need to run it like every week, but you certainly need to be evaluating this, you know, on a regular cadence. And the other thing I would say is um, if you do like a major update or a major technology change or refresh, you need to go and reevaluate the DR plan. If you add a new data store, reevaluate the DR plan. If you change the way that your application is deployed, reevaluate the DR plan. Um, I, I can't say it enough that it's it's not a it's not a. Uh, there used to be a great infomercial on television when I was younger about a rotisserie, and the slogan was "Set it and forget it." DR plans are not a set it and forget it type thing. They're a set it and revisit it. Um, so yeah, that was my uh, my big learning here. Yeah. I'll add to that too, like another reason that um, you'd want to revisit it and potentially change things. And I kind of touched on it in the beginning, like business business requirements have changed or business outcomes have changed. Something about the business's level of risk tolerance has changed. And oftentimes that would that that, that can impact and change um, the RPOs and the RTOs that really drive, you know, those um, those disaster re uh, data recovery plans for sure. Um, on the subject of risk, though, kind of begs the question, um, how do we think about what level of risk is acceptable? I mean, for, I can kind of speak to that from a business point of view, at least. Um, it's usually related to some sort of, like I said, business outcome or business decision. Um, one example would be you're looking to achieve some sort of compliance, um, something like SOC 2 or ISO 27001. Uh, that's, uh, those are both like fantastic frameworks to really up your security game in general but it really helps you think about the needs that you have within your business. And you know your data recovery strategy is, is one of those needs that you need to be thinking about. Another one is really like your customers. Your customers may end up just telling you like, we're not willing to buy your product unless you demonstrate a um, appropriate level of re uh, reliability and availability within your business. Um, those are definitely things that, 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 that help change the risk profile of the company. But Dave, like, you know, there are definitely things that um, the business needs from people uh, in your role to help drive that decision making. So like talk about some of those things. 
Yeah, I think a, a, a couple of things. I'll come, go back again to classification of data, and hopefully by keep mentioning these things that a theme evolves over here. Like, like the, yeah. the 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 risk is directly related to how important is this data, how 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 much can we afford to lose? There's RPO again, um, and the services that are processing this data, how important are they? And I'll illustrate this with a with a great example. I attended a talk years ago by um, Netflix, and they were talking about criticality of services. And many people have used Netflix or at least some streaming service. And there's there's a line that says, oh, here's the shows I favorited. And uh, that, that line is populated by a service. But guess what? If that service fails, you can still watch stuff. So that service has a much lower RPO, RTO than say the service that serves up the main screen. And I find it's the same in, in any line of business. You know, we have many services that make up Rewind. Some are more important than others. And can your service still, you know, function if service A is unavailable? Um, so putting it in Rewind terms, we have, for example, a service that collects stats about backups. Every time we run backups, we gather all these metrics about, you know, success rates, failure rates, all that stuff. That's very interesting. But if that service fails, we can still run backups. Backups can still work. Restores can still work. We can still service our customers. So th that service and the data it gathers, you know, has a has a much much lower risk profile than our core service that is actually doing backups. So again, it comes back to classification of data. Um, that you know, the the risk of a service failing or or being unavailable. Um, all those things feed into you know you know answering the question of what level of risk is unacceptable. Yep. Um, we're getting to the end here. If you do have questions, please, I think, add them to the uh, the Q&A to the chat. A um, couple more things, though, on our plate to go through. Um, I think it's it's really important that we talk about the difference in data recovery um, as we think about like transitioning or just even um, cloud or excuse me, on prem to cloud. So, Dave, you and I both know like people don't understand the difference between on prem and cloud, especially as it pertains to data protection. Um, and that's not good. Like it's actually problematic. I think uh, certainly if people like you in your role or people like me in my role don't really understand that fundamental difference. So let's do everybody a service here and try and like clear that up for folks. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I have worked in tech for nearly 30 years now, and I remember the days of having large racks of servers and walking into rooms and big loud air conditioners and all this kind of stuff. And DR was very different then because, you know, you would typically have a data center and then you would have another data center somewhere else. And DR has a very real ongoing cost. If I've got a bunch of servers here, I have to assume that they are all going to die and I need that same capacity somewhere else. Um, now, in the cloud, I, I, I think it's significantly easier, but it's still not no work. There's definitely a, a, uh, a, a mantra that, oh, well, I'm running it in the cloud. Surely it's, you know, I get disaster recovery for free. And, the, you know, the short answer there is you don't. Uh, and I'll refer back to this terminology that um, our cloud provider, AWS, uses, and we use ourselves, this shared responsibility model. The the handling the disaster is our responsibility. Amazon gives us the tools to be able to do that, but we have to deal with it. And there's, you know, the, there's a couple of good examples here where where cloud differs from on-prem. The first is, and I'll use AWS example, but this this applies to Azure, Google, Rackspace, Oracle, all the different clouds. They have the same the same terminology, but you know, they have a concept of availability zones, and you should be running your application across multiple availability zones. You can think of an availability zone like a data center. It's not it's not quite like that, but it's a good enough analogy. And so you've got some resiliency there that if somebody cuts a fiber cable into a data center, oh, well, we already have our services running here. And, you know, we have an emoji in our Slack called nothing to do here. Um, that, that emoji should apply here. That if, if you lose uh, services in an availability zone, there should be nothing for you to do. It should just automatically fail over. That's a real nice benefit you get from running in cloud versus on-prem. Typically in on-prem, you know, you've got lots of complex systems that are determining is this up, is that up. That gets farmed out to the cloud provider and they take care of is the availability zone up. Um, the other nice thing about cloud versus on-prem is you can have, because you can spin up infrastructure 
pretty easily. Um, you can kind of have these these warm or or pilot like standby modes where you know you're you're continuously if you're an application vendor or, or a var like us you're continuously pushing code and ap application updates to your code to somewhere else but you're not actually running the services that you need to serve up that code so you're saving a lot of money. Um, but you know you're ready to go and you can switch things on very quickly. We call this a, a kind of pilot light -like setup. So we have all our code there, we have all our data there, but we're not actually running the, the services required to serve up that stuff, but we know we can turn it on very quickly. Um, so again, you know, with, with the cloud, you've got this just, you've just got a lot more flexibility than you do with on-prem. I don't have to go and purchase 50 rack mount Dell servers. I can just click some buttons or, or run some infrastructure as code and, Boom! I've got I've got you know disaster recovery on demand. You know, for the most part, I mean, cloud providers have capacity limits as well, so you need to make sure the capacity is already there. But you just gain a lot of flexibility with uh, with with public cloud solutions that you just didn't have with on-prem. You know, you really had to think about capacity a lot. Oh, I'm buying ten new servers. Oh, I really need twenty new servers, and I've got to put some in the in the DR location. That, that you have to think about that a lot less now. The other piece about on-prem to cloud um, that let's be honest, a lot of people aren't thinking about is like your applications, like SaaS. The days of, of you and I remembering that, uh, you know, we would run Microsoft Office, for example, on our, on our desktops, um, those are gone. Everything's running in your browser these days um, in the cloud. There's something to be said there too, right? From a data recovery point of view. Yeah, so, I mean, this this is rewind reason 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 for existence. You know, is is all this stuff that's running in the in the public cloud, and it's somebody else's responsibility. Um, it's true, but just just like ourselves running with Amazon, the data is our responsibility. None of these these uh, either public cloud providers or even SaaS applications you use, you know, the, the data is yours. They're giving you all the infrastructure and all the pieces to use that, but you're responsible for the data. Um, this is why, I mean, this is almost a plug, but but it's it so fits into this is having a good backup of all of your data is just something you need. How can you recover if you don't have the data? Um, yeah. In our own ca our own case, you know, for some of our services, we use backup and recovery as our as our DR plan. What you would think of as traditional backup and recovery. The same applies to SaaS applications. We have backups of our own. For example, our own GitHub repositories. We have backups of our own Jira instance. We have backups of our own uh, Confluence pages. You know, et cetera, et cetera. Like, like uh, the the providers provide the, the the infrastructure for that, but we own the data. Yep. I mean, when you think about how far we've come, it's not it's not hard to reflect on all these things that we've learned along the way. Like you touched on a lot of them, but like if you were to summarize, what are the things that really jump out at you? Uh, in hindsight that we learned along the way? Yeah, I mean, th this is the classic lesson, lessons learned question, really, that you yeah. would find in, in a retrospective. And I, I, I love these these type of questions. So my number one thing for learning for me to pass on is is tabletop testing. I, you know, in the words of Kenny Banya from uh, Seinfeld, it's gold, Jerry, gold. Um, we, we learned so much just from doing tabletop testing, just getting people around a, well, a virtual table now over things like Zoom um, and just even asking questions. Uh, and having somebody who'd done that before to lead it was was super, super, super valuable. I can't say enough about how good that was, which leads into my second lesson learned is talk to people who've done this before, attend these kind of webinars, which is, you know, two, two guys on Zoom talking about our, our experiences, but attend these kind of webinars, read blog posts, um, if, if you can be introduced to contact. Just sometimes uh, one area I found that was, you know, surprisingly valuable was I'd read a blog post from somebody about about DR and I just reached out to the author and I said, hey, can I can I chat to you about this for 30 minutes? They said, sure. A lot of people would actually love to talk to you about it and share their knowledge. I mean, certainly that's the case for me. Um, so don't be afraid to reach out to people. We talked about having, um, in our case, we're lucky to have somebody on staff, but but have an expert who's who's done this kind of stuff before. They don't have to have done the nuts and bolts before, but they've run and set up DR process before. Um, something that you know I found early on on the technical side is don't try and boil the ocean. So you know we 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 gave a bunch of engineers it's like come up with our DR plan and there's a real tendency to try and automate everything immediately. Um, don't do that. Start with what what are the steps I need to do? 
Okay, now write down all the commands for those and then find out which things are worthwhile automating. Something that is very easy to do, you probably don't need to, need to you know, invest time automating that. Something that's very complex, maybe that's worth automating. So I, I wrote down in some notes of don't try and boil the ocean. Um, classify data, again, you know, that was going back to our, our first discussion, that was one of our first things is you can't, you can't decide how you're gonna have uh, disaster recovery for data unless you know what the data is and what the, the risk profile of that data is and the value of that data is. So go through the effort, classify all the data that you've got. Um, and then I guess the, the last thing is back to our conversation on risk profiles is, um, you know, most services now are made up of many services that run those services. How critical is each service? Is it in the critical path? If it is, you know, you want to pay attention to our, to a low RPO and RTO. If it's not, you can afford to do things like, you know, oh, we're, we're, we can lose up to a day's worth of data for this service. So, you know, knowing how important the service is and where it is in the critical path of whatever your system is, is important. Yeah, well said. I, I'll echo the classified data piece. And as somebody that uh, played a heavy influence, I would say, in the design of a lot of Rewind systems, I think being cognizant and aware of what your um, classifications are before you start building something, I think is really important because I know when we went through this exercise and you're nodding your head, right? We looked at a couple of things and we're like, how the heck are we even gonna do this? Cause we just made some, we'll say poor decisions, I guess, from a data recovery point of view. And it forced us to kind of take a step back and reevaluate um, those things to make sure that we were able to, you know, meet the uh, the recovery point and the um, uh, and those objectives, those those objectives that we had for our our strategy. Okay, uh, that's it for like the, the the discussion points that that Dave and I, I think we're going to go through. Um, I'm going to look at the Q and A now. A couple of you have submitted some questions, so thank you for doing that. If you do have some, I encourage you to to ask them. Um, anonymous attendee asks, are there instances where different types of data recovery techniques are better than others? So thinking about point in time versus file level recovery as an example. What do you think there, Dave? Yeah, I can, I can take this one. So yeah, I mean, I, I there's obviously many different uh, uh, recovery techniques and we touched on some of them, you know, things like backup restore, active active, pilot light, warm standby, all these different things. And my short answer to that is, um, uh, yes, but cost comes into it. So, you know, I, I flippantly said earlier on to James, you know, hey, Dave, we need to have a one minute, one minute um, RPO for this service. Okay, great. Give me $10 million. Um, the, the, the reality is that each one has a place depending on the RPO, RTO. Everything comes back to RPO, RTO and classification of data. So, you know, to use use my simple example earlier on, a service that is processing batch data daily, yeah, you can just do a simple a simple backup and restore of that data. Um, a service that's doing stuff more transactionally, you probably want something like a like a as closer to real time data as you uh, a data backup solution or data replication solution as you can get. So, uh, you know, there's there's many different. Um, many different ways and tools you can use, and, and they all have their place. And our, in our own case, we use a mix. You know, for some solutions, we have like a real-time database replication system going. For others, we have nightly backups. For others, we have backups that run once an hour, depending on the classification of the data. Nice. Um, next question, also from anonymous attendee. Uh, how do you strike a balance between automation and human oversight? How do you continue to strike that balance as dev operations grow, expand, or get more complex? Yeah, I can I, I can take this one as well, James. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm asking. I, <laughs> <laughs> I briefly touched on this earlier on, you know, when I was talking about putting together a, um, a, a good technical runbook. So I'll answer this from the technical perspective. But I also said at the end, you know, hey, if you're starting from scratch, what will you do? What lessons is don't boil the ocean. So the way we approached things was we came up with, or we have come up with a, a detailed technical runbook. And, and when I say detailed, I mean, it's very detailed. And this is what we test on a cadence. Um, and every time we test it, we look through and say, you know, what, what are the opportunities for things in here that are kind of a pain that we really could automate? Uh, so, you know, for example, we've, we test our DL plan 
actually biannually, and we just did this like uh, this quarter. Um, and when we tested the DR plan biannually, we look for um, two things. Number one is, is there an opportunity to decrease our RPO or RTO for any services? And number two is, are there anything in these in these technical run books that we run through that we think could be automated and would then make it more reliable, better, just less manual work? Um, and and, and in the short answer is we found in both cases, yes, we could we could decrease our, our RTO, our time, our, you know, time to actually recovery by automating some of these these things. But we didn't we cognizantly didn't do that the first time we came up with this, because the first step is you got to have a plan first. And only by executing the plan will you know the areas that are ripe for automation. Um, and, you know, there isn't a one size fits all answer to this is, oh, always automate these things. You will know which things need to be automated after you've run through testing the plan a couple of times. And the engineers on your team are telling you, Dave, this sucks. I don't want to do this again. It's like, great, automate it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, we've got another question here. How frequently should tabletop testing be performed? How do you balance the value of the exercise versus the time cost involved in doing that tabletop test? Excellent question. Um, yeah. I, I, so uh, talking from our own experience, we've actually committed to doing uh, DR testing um, biannually, so twice a year. Um, and in that, we're going to go through a full run rundown of our technical um, technical runbook, and we're going to do a tabletop test. Um, the tabletop test actually only takes, you know, probably an hour, maybe two hours. Um, so I feel an investment of two hours each quarter is 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 well worth it. So that you know, if this happens at two in the morning, we're not scrambling. The run through of the technical run books that can take significantly longer. But again, I'd rather invest the time in in doing that. You know, biannually or or quarterly, depending on what your threat your threat, or even annually, um, than having to scramble at, at two in the morning. Um, I will say that when we've run through both of these, we found stuff for improvement in each case. So doing the tabletop testing, it's like, oh, this phone number is not up to date for somebody we've got a contact. Okay, let's fix that. Running through the technical runbook. Oh, this service has slightly changed. Let's update the technical runbook for that. I view, I view all of this stuff as like an insurance policy. You know, why, why do we buy insurance policies when the probability of our house burning to the ground is 0 0.001, repeating, of course? Um, you know, we buy insurance because because we we, we want to be prepared. If this does happen, we don't want to be scrambling to, you know, find some money to rebuild our house. It's the same thing here. Um, I, I don't I don't think you need to invest. You know, I wouldn't test a DR plan every week, but I think probably biannually is 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 as low as I would personally go. Yeah, it kind of goes to that saying of like the best defense is a good offense, you know, and that's what these these plans are. Yep. If you have a strategy to to even like circumvent anything from happening in the first place, you definitely want to do it. It's funny, I, as you were talking, it kind of brought me back to the conversation you and I were having yesterday as we were um, going through our quarterly planning. And I was challenging you on something and you were like, well, what is the cost of the business if we don't do this? And to me, like, that's another excellent question to be asking yourselves as you're thinking about like balancing investments, whether it's in tabletops, data recovery, um, really any kind of um, uh, anything associated with risks to the business. Like, what are you willing to, uh, to, to, to take on? What are those, those things you're willing to accept? That tends to, to be quite enlightening. <laughs> uh, okay, I've got another question here. How can organizations decide which services they provide are truly essential? Um, in the case of Rewind, it's a bit obvious. Restores uh, seem to be pretty key. But what are some key indicators that something is, quote unquote, essential and therefore can't tolerate a high level of risk? That, that, that's another good question. Um, I mean, the, the short answer is, is only you can determine that by knowing what your application is. Um, but but there, there is some clear guidance, I think, is... Um, you know, the two examples I gave, actually, I'll, I'll give the, the Netflix one again, because this was an eye-opening uh, thing for me. It must be about 10 years ago now. You know, it's like, I'm just a user of Netflix. I watch Netflix. I get all these bars on the screen with all my stuff. And I had noticed that sometimes my, my favorite list just doesn't appear. And I just didn't pay any mind to it. I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'll go find the show that I want to watch. 
And then I attended this talk where I, I discovered why that was the case. It's like this service is unavailable, but guess what? I can still watch Netflix. So I think you have to tie it into what is the critical revenue generating piece of your service? In the case of Netflix, it's users can watch videos and they still want to keep subscribing. Um, in the case of Rewind, it's you know users can do backups and users can do restores. You need to look at what is the critical revenue generating piece of your business and the services you're running and decide what's in the critical path to those working. Um, I, again, the example I gave in our case, but there's actually a few services like this that we have that are, they're important to Rewind, but they're not in that critical path where we, you know, people subscribe to Rewind to run backups or run restores. And when they don't work, big alarms flash around our offices. People get paged, you know, lots of people think. But if the service that generates stats on backups, which is important to us, we want to know these metrics. If that has a problem, nobody's getting woken up at two in the morning for that. Um, so, you know, you can, you can kind of determine it by, you know, uh, revenue impact to the business, criticality to what I'll call your critical path. And, you know, another area to look at is what I just said is, are people getting woken up at two in the morning if this service has a problem? If they're not, it's probably not in your critical path. Well said. Awesome.